Have you ever wondered how your brain processes information? How it elegantly, yet efficiently, sifts through the barrage of sensory data every second, making sense of the world around you? It's a veritable marvel of nature, isn't it? But what if we could replicate that process, not in flesh and blood, but in silicon and code? Enter the world of neural networks. A neural network, in the simplest terms, is a computing system inspired by the human brain. It's designed to learn from data, much like how we learn from experiences. It's not a single entity, but a collection of nodes or neurons interconnected in a vast and complex network. Each of these artificial neurons takes in multiple inputs, applies a weight to them, a measure of their importance, and then uses a function to decide whether to pass the result along to the next neuron. It's a bit like a game of telephone where each player adds their own twist to the message before passing it along. But the real magic happens during the training process. As the network is exposed to more and more data, it adjusts the weights and biases of its neurons. This process, known as backpropagation, is how a neural network learns. It's a bit like refining a recipe, tweaking the ingredients and measurements until you get the perfect dish. Now you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Computers have been processing data for years. Well, the beauty of neural networks lies not in their ability to process data, but in their ability to learn from it. They can identify patterns and trends that would be impossible for a human to spot, making them invaluable in fields as diverse as medicine, finance, and even art. Imagine a doctor being able to diagnose a rare disease by feeding a neural network thousands of medical images, or a financial analyst predicting market trends with uncanny accuracy, or an artist creating stunning masterpieces with a few strokes of code. That's the power of neural networks. To summarize, a neural network is a system of artificial neurons that processes data much like the human brain. It learns from data through a process called backpropagation, adjusting the weights and biases of its neurons to improve its performance. And it's not just a tool for data processing, it's a tool for discovery, for creation, and for innovation. So the next time you marvel at the complexity of the human brain, remember, we're living in an age where we're not just understanding that complexity, but replicating it. And who knows, maybe one day we'll even surpass it. Welcome to the future. Welcome to the world of neural networks. So an artificial neuron network is a computational model based on the structure and functions of a biological neural network. Information that flows through the network affects the structure of the neural network because a neural network actually learns based on that input and output. Neural networks are considered statistical data modeling tools where the complex relationships between inputs and outputs are modeled and patterns are found. Neural networks takes data samples rather than entire data sets to arrive at solutions which ultimately saves both time and money. So neural networks have three layers that are interconnected. The first layer consists of input neurons. Those neurons send data on the second layer, which in turn sends the output neurons to the third layer. In this particular neural network, you have two hidden layers to be counted as one layer. So how can we use a neural network to our advantage? Let's say that this is an image that we want to reproduce through a neural network. We want to get an output from the neural network 
that is either solid, vertical, diagonal, or horizontal. Why can't we just put a protocol in the input, feed forward the network, and get an output that we desire? Because neural networks do not work that way. We have to come up with an algorithm and allocate some type of algorithmic calculation or function to train that network to giving us an output in which we want. So for example, in the particular image that we're using for an example, we are allocating a number between 1.0 and negative 1.0 for the brightness. So the darker the picture, we are going to allocate negative 1.0 for that. And to brighten the picture, we are going to allocate plus 1.0. So we're going to allocate black to negative 1, and we're going to allocate white to plus 1 with gray at a 0 value in the middle. At that point, this gives us a input vector to work with, okay? And now we have values to work with to actually create and implement a neuron. So now that we have our neuron, we actually can add or take away weights to make the neuron input as we like. As you can see here, the black line represents the negative values, okay, which implement a darker shade of the picture, whereas the white line is thicker and represents a lighter shade of the image and a positive number. So given the values, we get an output that to create our neuron that ultimately adds up to negative 1.075. So that gives us a value for our neuron. So next, once we have that value input or that activation function, we put it into a hidden layer. But before we put it into a hidden layer, we squash the value or compress it into a sigmoid value. And in a sigmoid squashing function, we take the X and Y values and where they meet on the sigmoid is the actual value. The further the sigmoid goes out, the higher the value, okay? However, no matter what value you have and where you start, the answer will always be between negative one and one. So now that we have our input value and our input layers or layer, now we have additional layers or one additional layer in this particular case, which is our first 
hidden layer, and it is of a sigmoid value. We add two more layers, two more hidden layers, to give us two sigmoid hidden layers and one rectified linear layer. And a rectified linear layer or unit is where if the number is positive, you keep it. If it's not, you ditch it. That simple. Then we have an output layer. Okay. So in a perfect world, we could have put in the protocol a specific set of rules or guidelines and get the output that we want, but that's not the way it works in a neural network. We have no control over an untrained neural network. And so if it's not trained and we don't have a trained model for it to follow, we get everything but the output that we expect. So how can we, even with rectification, without being trained, we still have a crazy high error rate in our output. So how do we get the neural network to give us the output that we're looking for? Well, we have to train the network. And we do that with what we call back propagation. And so we will continue part two of Welcome back, fellow programmers. And this is part two of our theory on neural networks. We last seen a network with an output of a true value in part one. While we also learn that we cannot use rules or protocol as an initial input to the neural network to get the truth or wanted results as an output. And we also learn that we have to actually train the neural network to get the actual truth results or the wanted results from the neural network. So we do this using back propagation. And back propagation, the first step is finding the error rate. So here we have the error rate of the four outputs, solid, vertical, diagonal, and horizontal. We add up the error rate to get a, the errors to get one total error rate. We have the truth, which is the wanted output, okay? And we have the answer, which is the actual unlearned output of the neural network or untrained answer from the untrained neural network. So the air between the truth and the answer 
So let's say the air is the magnitude between the truth and the answer. We take the magnitude and we get the error. We add them all up here. It is 3.25. Now, that is somewhat of an high, a high error rate. We need to deduce that down the best that we can to 0 0.5. 0, 0.01 air rate, which is also to say 99.99 accuracy. So we do that by adjusting the weights in the neural network. So we can adjust this weight up or down whichever way that deduces the error rate, and we call this gradient descent. We want to deduce the error rate by adding or subtracting the weight. So here we have added ever so slightly just one to the weight and that created a change in the error to give us a negative two and so the change in weight in relation to the change in error this relation is the actual slope so we can say that the slope is equal to the change in error in relation to the change in weight. And we can also say the slope is equal to the derivative of E with respect to W. In this case, we added one to the weight, which made the error negative two, which gave us a slope value of negative two. So here we have a regular or a simple neural network with an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer with a weight in between each layer. we can say that y is equal to x times the weight. If we change the weight ever so slightly, then we'll get the derivative of y with respect to the weight equals the slope, which is x. So I'm not going to give a calculus lesson here, but what I want to point out is that the derivative of E with respect to the weight is equal to the product of the first two derivatives, okay? And with that, we will take and multiply every derivative for every little 
change and we will multiply them to get the overall slope in the chain. And this is called chaining. So we chain the derivatives or the slope and we feed it back or we back feed it into the neural network and all of the calculations, the weights, the synapses learn from our input that we put in the output and ran it backwards to back propagate to teach the network. So it learns, goes through the synapses, comes out the input layer and then goes back into the input layer and it repeats this step with the proper calculations and adjusting the synapses and the weights according to our corrected input until it comes out with a truth value or a value that we want from training it. And once it learns that value the way we want it to be, then it will output it according to whatever error setting that you set it to, the best being 0 0.01 or 99.99% accurate. So this will conclude part two of our theory on neural networks. Next, we will jump into some coding and implement a neural network. Welcome back. And in this particular lecture, we are going to talk about basic neural network subroutines, better known as BNNS, versus metal performance shaders convolutional neural networks, better known as MPS CNN. The Accelerate Frameworks basic neural network subroutine is a collection of functions that you can use to construct neural networks. It is supported in Mac OS, iOS, TV OS, and watch OS. It's optimized for all CPUs supported on those preceding platforms. BNNS supports implementation and operation of neural networks for inference using input data previously derived from training. BNNS does not do training. However, its purpose is to provide very high performance inference on already trained networks. BNNS provides functions for creating, applying, and destroying three kinds of layers. The first is the convolutional layer. For each pixel in an input image, it takes that pixel and its neighboring pixels and combines their values with weights from the training data to compute the corresponding pixel in the output image. The second layer is the pooling layer. That produces a smaller output image from its input image by breaking the input image into smaller rectangular sub-images 
and each pixel in the output is the maximum or average of the pixels in the corresponding sub image. Note that a pulling layer does not use training data. And the final layer is a fully connected layer. And that takes input as a vector. And that vector is multiplied by a matrix of weights from training data. The resulting vector is updated by the activation function. So BNNS uses the following API types and filters. Common data types. This enumeration defines the basic data numeric types that can be specified in parameters to BNNS functions. Function types. These are types for user-defined memory management functions. Layer parameter types. These are types or structures used for parameters to the functions that create layers and filters and filter parameter types. And this is a structure type that's used for parameters to the functions that creates layers and filters. Then there finally is the create and destroy filters and layers functions. And those, are, and those functions apply a filter to an input or to a set of input as inferred. So the Metal Performance Shaders Frameworks contains a collection of highly optimized compute and graphic shaders that are designed to integrate easily and efficiently into your Metal app. These data parallel primitives are especially tuned to take advantage of the unique hardware characteristics of each GPU family to ensure optimal performance. Apps adopting the Metal Performance Shaders framework can be sure of achieving optimal performance without needing to update their own handwritten shaders for each new GPU family. So metal performance shaders can be used along with your app's existing metal resources, such as the MTL command buffer, which is a container that stores encoded commands that are committed to and executed by the GPU. Then the MTL texture, which is a memory allocation for storing formatted image data that is accessible to the GPU. And finally, there is the MTL buffer, which is a memory allocation for storing unformatted data that is accessible to the GPU, objects and shaders. So why use BNNS or MPSCNN in the first place? Well, let's start by discussing what both these frameworks do. In their current form, BNNS and MPSCNN are useful for performing inference on convolutional neural networks. Nothing more and nothing less. Apple's deep learning frameworks are tuned for just one single purpose. Pushing data as quickly as possible through the network's layers. So why is Apple giving us two APIs if they do the same thing? Simply 
because MPS runs on the GPU, whereas BNNS and the Accelerate framework runs on the CPU. So now, let's create an app that shows the difference between the two. So if you have not opened up the starter project, you can do so now. And once you get that open, you're going to go ahead and click on the viewcontroller.swift file. So the first thing we want to do is import the Quartz Core module framework. And that's an Objective-C framework that helps split the processing, primarily used in graphic applications or GPU applications. So let's do that now. So next we want to create a function to time the BNNS versus the MPS. And we'll create a constant called start time. And we'll return the current media time. Now we need to make a protocol for the logger with a function log that contains a message that is a string. So now we need to add a logger to the class and set our text box to empty when it loads. And we need to run our metal versus BNS function. Now we'll create a log function. And with this, we just need to reset the text box once the reset button is tapped. And so with that, we can run our application. And as you can see, Metal versus BNS matrix. MPS took 2.6 seconds. BNNS took 2.9 seconds. And it shows the first 10 results with the largest error and the average error. So that will conclude this lecture on M. PS CNNs versus B N N S from the Accelerate framework. See you next lecture. Welcome back. And in this lecture, we are going to learn about convolutional neural networks, or CONNETs, or CNNs for short. A convolutional neural network makes the explicit assumption that the inputs are images. This allows us to encode certain properties into the architecture. These then make the forward function more efficient to implement and vastly reduce the amount of parameters in the network. The layers of a CNN have neurons arranged in three dimensions. Width, 
height and depth. Now, notice that the word depth here refers to the third dimension of the activation volume, not the depth of a full neural network, which is usually referred to as the total number of layers in the network. Also, we use three main types of layers to build a convolutional neural network. The first layer is the convolutional layer. The second layer is the pooling layer. And the third layer is the fully connected layer. The key idea here is that we are doing a convolution over neighboring edges of the image. So for a given edge, the edge to edge filter convolves over neighboring edges of that given edge. As you see in the yellow cross or filter sliding over the input on the left, to produce the output responses on the right. While in the edge to edge filter, we do a convolution or a weighted sum over neighboring edges with respect to an edge. In the edge to node filter, we do a convolution over the neighboring edges with respect to the node. We do a convolution or a weighted sum over its neighboring edges, where neighboring edges are defined as all edges directly connected to the node. The node to graph filter is equal to a fully connected layer when applied after an edge to node filter. The edge to node filter summarizes the neighboring edges with respect to a single node and the output represents the weighted sum of the edges adjacent to a specific node. Applying a fully connected filter to the responses of edge to node filter gives us a single response that summarizes all the nodes into a single graph response. So let's see how this works on a face recognition recognition neural network. Let's start off with face detection. Now face detection is something we already have in our SDK, but we're offering in the Vision Framework new this year a face detection that's based on deep learning. And you may already know that deep learning has made groundbreaking changes in accuracy what we can do with uh, vision technologies, and face detection is no exception. We're going to have higher precision, which means fewer false positives, but we are also going to have dramatically higher recall, which means we'll miss less faces. So let's look at some of the examples of faces that we will now be able to detect with the vision framework. For one thing, we'll be able to detect smaller faces. We'll also be doing a better job of detecting strong profiles. We'll also do a better job detecting more partially occluded faces, and that includes things like hats and glasses. So if you have not downloaded the Swift Vision API Project 2 starter project, go ahead and do so now. And we're going to get started with our face detection application. So the first thing we want to do is to programmatically call in a image to our application, and we'll do that under our view did load. And I've already imported two pictures. in our assets folder, okay, called EGT detect and EGDetect2. 
you can use your own pictures. Just make sure that there are faces available to be detected uh, with the application. But these are the two in your starter project. Now we will pull a request with the vision detect face rectangles request function. Then we need the results. And we just need to finish calling our handlers for the face detection. To clean up your code, you just select Command All and then Control I. That cleans up your syntax. So we'll do the handlers now. Next. So with that, let's go ahead and run our app. And let's see, we're detecting the faces, three of the four faces in the front row. The second row, we're detecting one face and one face in the third row. It's not, however, it's not detecting way back here for these two faces. So let's switch images here. And it seems to be detecting all of the faces here in this female hockey league. So that is the vision API face detection. And that can be integrated with models as well. We didn't even have to use a model for the face detection. If you add a model to it, it can be even more powerful. And we will be going over models in our next project. So we'll see you there.
Welcome back. And in this lecture, you will learn about core machine learning models or core ML for short. Core ML is a trained model that applies a machine learning algorithm to a set of training data. The model makes predictions based on that new input data. Core ML is the foundation for domain-specific frameworks and functionality. Core ML supports the vision framework, which applies high-performance image analysis and computer vision techniques to identify faces, detect features, and classify scenes in images and video. Then there is the foundation framework, which accesses essential data types, collections, and operating system services to define the base layer of functionality for your app. There's also Gameplay Kit for evaluating learned decision trees. And Core ML itself builds on top of other Apple deep learning frameworks like Accelerate and BNNS, as well as Metal Performance Shaders. So, with Core ML, a model is just a function learned from data. The logic from this function is learned from data, it then takes the inputs and gives us an output. Core ML supports multiple neural network implementations from encoding a sentiment analysis function in a feed for neural network to predicting text in a generalized linear model. So where do we get these models? Well, we go to developer.apple.com slash machine learning. Here you'll see two of the models, one which detects the scenes of an image from 205 categories, the other which detects the dominant objects present in a image from a set of a thousand categories such as trees, animals, food, vehicles, people, etc. Both of these models we will be implementing in our final two projects. Core ML is compatible with Mac OS, iOS, Watch OS, and TV OS. So with that, let's build a neural network with Core ML. So go ahead and open up your Project 3 starter project if you have not done so already. And as you can see here, I've already dragged in the model for this Core ML project. And you'll see that the evaluation parameters as the inputs as a scene image sized at 224 by 224 pixels. And the description is an input of an image of a scene to be classified. And it outputs a dictionary that is a string and or a double, along with the probability of each scene. Once you drag in a model, a class is 
automatically generated for you. If this is not highlighted, if it's all grayed out, then make sure with this highlighted over here that you go over here in your utilities pane and go down to where it says target membership and make sure that there is a check mark there where it says the name of your project. This was going to be the second project, but I made it the third one because I wanted to do the BNNS versus metal. So that's why that says that. Nonetheless, make sure it's checked and this will be highlighted. And if you click on this, you'll see where it tells us that the file was automatically generated and it should not be edited. And it looks something like this. So that file was automatically generated once the model was dragged into the project. So we want to call this model into our project. So the first thing that we will do is assign the model to a constant in our project. You control it. So let's do that now. So now we need to get the scene for a specific image. Now we need to interact with our model. So now it is asking us for a CV pixel buffer and which I've already done here. So we won't have to go through all of that code in our view controller. So instead, we'll create a constant that we can attach our image processor to and add a guard statement with a return scene. So let's do that now. So now we can use the scene label function to call it to analyze the image. And so with that, let's run our app. And as you can see, I tap the picture, construction site, a bamboo forest, and a sea cliff. So you could, uh, Add your own pictures if you like. Just make sure that they are 224 by 224. And you put them in the assets folder and then select them from the utility viewer. If you have any questions, send me an email or put it up for discussion. And I will respond expeditiously. That concludes our core ML model first project. We will be implementing another Core ML application in our next project. See you there. Welcome back, fellow coders. And in this particular lecture, we are going to learn about Core ML tools.
I have seeked the information highway, high and low. And there is a very limited amount of resources on how to install Core ML tools and or how to use Core ML tools. In this lecture, I am going to show you eight easy steps to install CoreML tools in creating your very first CoreML model. There are so many different models out there that you can use. While there is a very limited amount on the Apple site, there's a lot of third party models that you can use. However, you cannot use them unless you have Core ML tools installed. So you see there's Cafe, Keras, Ski Kit Learn, Lib SVM, Turi, DMLC. And there's just such a large array of models that you can use. You don't have to learn Python. Um, even if you want to be a data scientist and go into machine learning that way, Apple has so many frameworks that it's unbelievable to create a neural network where you don't have to use a model. I showed you that in our first project. Um, you just have to find them and you have to use them. So in this particular project, we are going to create a model from a cafe model that identifies flowers. Well, Brian, why flowers? Are you something strange? No, I, it's just the easiest one to do, to be honest with you. So that's why I chose this particular one. In fact, Apple uses it for an example, so who am I? So we're going to go ahead and we're going to create this model in eight easy steps. Step one. Okay. Download and open the lesson files and place them on your desktop. After you place them on the desktop, make sure that they are not in the folder like you see here. Open that folder and drag them directly onto the desktop. Step two. Locate and install the Anaconda setup file that you dragged out of the folder onto your desktop. As you can see, the first one at the top there on the left. Step three, open up your terminal you can launch that and type terminal launcher on your Mac. Type in terminal and that'll bring it up. Okay. And type conda install Python equals 2.7.13. I've given you a PDF cheat sheet for you to follow 
alone. In fact, you're definitely going to use it in step seven so you can copy and paste the code for that step. Step number four, change the directory to desktop. And you do that with CD desktop. Step number five, initiate Python in the terminal. And you do that just by typing Python. Step number six, import Core ML tools in terminal. And you do that by typing import Core ML tools. Step number seven, copy and paste the syntax from your PDF where it says step seven into terminal. And when you're done, if you have successfully done it, you will see something like this. If your terminal is white, you'll see a different color, but you'll still see the same syntax. And step number eight, save the new model to your desktop using coreml underscore model dot save flowers dot ml models. And that's it. You should be able to go to your desktop and locate that model. You can use that model in your previous project. Just replace where it says ResNet 50 with flowers. And you can identify any flower, be it real or artificial. So congratulations on completing this lecture as well as congratulations on completing this crash course for neural networks for Swift developers, the iOS programmer's guide to neural networks. I would like to thank you for supporting me and Rouse Tech Apps. If you have any questions, please drop me an email or put it up for discussion by way of the Udemy platform. Until next course, this is Brian Rouse. Happy coding.